one. One, two. One, two, check two. One, two. One, two, two.
Okay, if everyone take their seats, please. Thank you all for coming. As you all know, we're here for strategic planning, and I'm not going to get into too much depth because we have an expert that's going to tell you about that. But suffice it to say that we have next year, we have a new strategic plan we have to do for 2025. And the Health Science Center is also doing the, their, um, all the schools are doing their strategic plans. And so we have our speakers integrating those, I believe. And as I said, she's the expert. So uh, Leslie Miel, I've known, we've been friends for five or more years now. And so uh, anybody knows anything about strategic planning, it's definitely Leslie. So Leslie, it's yours. Okay, so I'm just going to go over um, five-minute slide decks, and then we're just going to jump into questions. We have four questions that we're going to ask. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. So like I said, I'm going to go over just a handful of slides just to orient you as to what we're going to do in the planning process and sort of where we're at today. And then we have four questions that we really want to get input from the group on. So just bear with me. Like I said, first couple of minutes, we're just going to go over um, planning process, and then we'll jump into questions. Uh, and Suncrest, can someone just give me a shout out so I know you can hear me OK? Hello? They can't talk back to me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, okay, that could either be good or bad, I guess. Um, so this is the planning process that we're going to utilize within the School of Dentistry, and this is actually the planning process that we use with, uh, throughout the whole health sciences. And you're going to see every box in blue is what I call strategic planning, and that's really where you're just setting what it is that we want to do as a school, and everything in gold is operationalizing the plan. So in the past, a lot of times people roll their eyes when I talk about strategic planning because they think, oh, well, we don't do anything with it. And that's really not because of the strategic planning piece. It's really because people fail to operationalize the plan. So this piece is really important. Once you set your goals, your mission, your vision, and your goals, you have to turn it into action. And that's something that we're really going to focus on. Um, within the school, and I know even in the last planning process, the School of Dentistry did a good job in coming up with actions versus just saying, oh yeah, we have a goal, and then three years later looking at it and saying, oh, did we accomplish anything without it being intentional? So there'll be three deliverables within the planning process. The first one is what I call strategic compass, not a strategic plan. Compass is just a high-level document that will show the mission, the vision, and strategic priorities for the school. The measurement plan is where you document what it is you want to change in measurable terms. So if you had to objectively measure whether or not you were successful in implementing your goals that you have identified in the strategic compass, that occurs in the measurement plan. And then the third piece is an implementation plan. And really, those two that are in gold happen on an annual basis. So every year you should be asking yourselves, hey, we look at the strategic plan or compass. These are the goals in it. What are we doing to make a difference? What are we doing to actually achieve the goals that we have identified in our strategic compass? Versus the strategic compass, that's something that you could do every five to 10 years, set those overarching goals. And then what we should be doing on a regular basis, and I used to have annual here, but the bottom line is, is with technology, you could actually be doing on, ongoing progress reporting. It doesn't have to be necessarily a snapshot in time. You can kind of develop dashboards where it shows the progress on a regular basis versus just doing kind of like an annual report. So again, what we're primarily focusing on now to really the end of January into February is the development of the strategic compass. And that's where we look at the mission, the vision, and strategic priorities for the school. Each of the strategic priorities will have a handful, probably three to five strategic goals that get a little bit more granular in nature as you go down kind of like this structure. You know, we'll look at the existing mission and vision of the school. We'll have a discussion about like, okay, so is this something that we want to keep? Is it something that needs modified? And the same thing with the previous strategic goals. So you want to make sure that we don't do this in isolation. We want to consider what we've done in the past to make sure that it's as comprehensive as possible. 
So this is just an example of a strategic compass in case people are wondering what the heck is that. Um, I actually did this for WVU Medicine for the hospital, our Ruby Memorial, worked with a subcommittee of their board to develop this compass. And again, it is really meant to focus effort. So everybody's kind of rowing in the same direction. And as you can see, it's pretty high level. So there's a mission and vision. The, each of the ribbons represents a strategic priority. And so what's in bold, geez, I'm getting caught on here, is actually the strategic priority. And these items with the stars are what I call strategic goals. And this is really the level of detail that we're gonna get into. So like you can see, it's pretty high level. Where that magic really occurs is when you take this and you operationalize it and you say, okay, well, what are we gonna do about it? So for example, one of the strategic priorities for Ruby was access to care. Now there's nowhere on here where it says we're gonna build hospital, but that was part of the operational plan where they said, okay, look, you know, access to care is important. We don't want people leaving the state for care. So these are the actions we're gonna take in order to make that happen. This is, I just work with the School of Public Health and we developed a strategic compass for the school. And again, everything in the center, I would call a strategic priority. And then for each of those strategic priorities, like inspiring education, there are specific goals under each one of those. And again, we're just in the process of operationalizing their plan. We're forming a steering committee, and then we have a subcommittee uh, for each of those uh, priority areas. And their next step is to develop a measurement plan and an implementation plan for those in alignment with the budget process. So if there are resources that are required to do some of those initiatives, that we are aligned with budget, that, that those dollars can be considered for those projects. So again, just two examples so you have some idea of what our end result is gonna look like from the strategic planning process. And so the process that we're using, it's gonna be a process. So right now we've talked to the school's leadership council, we talked to members of the alumni, and we talked to students to gather feedback. And so we pretty much saved the best for last in talking with faculty and staff. And in all of these sessions, we asked three or four key questions that we solicited feedback on. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that information and it's gonna help inform a core writing group that's gonna kind of take that information, uh, pull it together and draft some statements. So we'll do a draft of a mission and vision. And then we're gonna share it back. So you're gonna hear, you, we will come back to you. It might be via survey, it might be via focus groups, and we'll have people react to it based on the feedback that we've received. So we're gonna do that throughout the process. So there'll be a mission and vision that will be developed, then strategic priorities, and then from the strategic priorities, we will develop goals. So again, it's gonna be a back and forth process. And like I said, these initial meetings are really important because they're really what's helping us narrow our focus when we go to the core writing group to help generate what this initial drafts look like. And then ultimately, I mean, what we're hoping for is to have this strategic compass that will help guide the school forward into the future. And one of the things I always have to touch on as a part of planning is strategic planning and development of strategy is great, but we also have to consider the other two parts of the triangle, which are culture and capabilities. And those that have heard me speak, I always give the example of innovation. So within academics, everybody wants to but when you look at our culture, we're typically a low risk culture, which is really not in alignment with innovation. And then also with capabilities, you know, if you want to be innovative, you need to have people that, you know, if you're trying to look at doing startups, or you're trying to develop new devices, you have to have people internally that know how to take that stuff from idea to market. So again, it's not as simple as saying, oh, well, we just want to be innovative. You have to take into account is our culture ready for that? Are we, can, is it conducive to that type of work? And do we have the capabilities that will allow us to do it? If the answer to that is, look, we want to do this strategy, and, but the answer is no to culture and no to capabilities, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just need, means that you have to pay attention to those other two aspects. Um, it's much easier to develop a strategy if you have a culture that's 
that it make, will make it flourish, as well as if you have the capabilities already internally. So it's a little bit heavier of a lift, heavier of a lift, but it certainly doesn't mean that you can't do it. So I just want people to keep that in the back of their minds as we go through this process. And so with that said, I mean, that's pretty much it for overall. I wanted to just give you a brief overview because I don't want to waste our time on me talking because we don't have a short period of time. So I want to jump into questions. Before I do, does anybody have a question on process? All right, well, let's just jump into um, question, the questions. And the first question that we would like feedback on is, what do you believe our school strengths are and what do you believe our challenges are? And I would like to start, I would like to lead with strengths. Um, and we do have somebody that's taking notes. Thank you, Fody. Uh, so we're recording uh, you know, the information that we collect. Again, it'll be instrumental in when we start drafting some of our statements. So I'm just gonna open the floor. We have mics that we can um, give to each other. So please make sure you have a mic um, so our colleagues at Suncrest can hear um, the comments that are being made. Not everybody jump at once. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, I think our strengths, and probably everybody would agree, are our people. Um, the professionals, our students, staff, everybody does a great job, and they really care about this place. And that's, I think that's probably our, our biggest strength. That's awesome. Others? So strong leadership. Others? Don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy. Your time. <laughs> They've already asked us our opinions. So yeah. We're going to stay quiet. It's up to the rest of you. We want to hear from everyone. You know, and I know typically people, it's harder to talk about strengths. When it's talk about weaknesses, that's everybody has, you know, that usually is not an issue, but... Location? Yes. I would say supportive environment, uh, physically and human. A supportive environment, mm -hmm. both from a physical perspective and human perspective? Yes, yes. So can you talk a little bit about that? So well, I say can say because, I mean, I, I am, uh, I mean, new here in the school. I've been here since May. And, okay. Uh, this month has been so uh, good for me because I mean the enterprises that I am trying to implement here, uh, I had found a very supportive environment. Awesome. Okay, so supportive environment. Other thoughts? So what, let's go back to the Morgantown, our location. So why do you think that that's a strength? Can you just expand on that a little? It may not be just Morgantown. I'm saying the location, you have people that, again, you have a patient pool if we can just identify that. Okay. We also have not only that location as far as we are in, we are with the university itself. Got it. And so therefore we have that supportive structure already there. Okay. And uh, not only that, the location as far as getting games. Okay. We have roads. Yeah, got it. I'd add an academic health center with schools of dentistry, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and public health. Okay, we're uh, that's okay. So we're part of an integrative health integrated health sciences with five schools. Yeah. Yes, um, I think one of the weaknesses. It's not really a weakness of the school. Is the fact that people come by and they don't even know there's a dental school here. There's nothing really stating that there's school of uh, school of dentistry it's all WBU medicine and so I think there needs to be more of a presence of our school okay that's a good one all right before we jump though it further into weaknesses let's uh, other strengths The rural practice program is a great strength for the school. Other thoughts? Here in the school, but also 
The schools, re, the schools use of high tech. High tech, and see, we're one of three schools that has that. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're exposed to things that the other schools do not have, so we're so, fortunate to have that. So that's a good area of distinction, right? The use of technology since we are one of three schools. Other thoughts? Yes. So I think that part of our strengths would be that we are infiltrated, if that's probably not the best word, but into Wheeling and Harrison County, and we're continuing to do that in the southern part of the state. So I think when you talk about location, yes, we have a prime location here, but community and not just do community outreach and awareness, but we're actually treating patients. That's awesome. So your clinical reach out into the community. Do you think that that's something that should grow? Do you think it's sort of good where it's at? Casting once. <laughs> um, so for instance, Kathy Brown is with Wheeling Health, right? And I think if we could send students to her on a daily basis, she would be pleased. So yes, there's opportunity for growth. Okay. It's just the manpower and the money and the, Absolutely. You know, the time that we have. Okay. Other strengths. Even though I've already spoken, I think one thing that everybody's left out is the faculty and the staff. We have an amazing group of people that work together that for the most part like each other, like working together. And with that is our size. Um, there's a second year dental student here from Massachusetts. I happen to know her father who is a pediatric dentist. And they of course looked at the schools in Boston and there's 200 in a class. And when I asked him how his daughter was doing, first thing he said was, quote, she's loving it. And I tell all my friends, can you imagine going to a school that has 200 in a class? She's got less than 50. So who do you think's getting the better education? So that's from someone outside the school. But I'm gonna, you all know I feel this way, but I'll take the opportunity. The faculty that we have is second to none. And that includes the staff. I think we work as a machine now, are there, Improvements to be made, of course, always that. We have some places to fill, but on the whole, I challenge anybody and any other school that has faculty that's as good as ours, not only academically, but in their personalities and working together. I'll take it. Other thoughts? Anything about sort of education programs? Uh, we heard a little bit about the use of in a you know technology or about students or recruitment of students. We heard a little bit about service to the state with having you know clinics outside of just kind of like the hub. Other thoughts? Okay, so we'll move ahead with challenges. So, what do you believe the challenges are? for the school. So having, feeling respected like medicine is on campus. Okay. Being it. You wanna expand on that? I've been here since 1976, and no offense to anybody that's redheaded, but we're like the redheaded stepchild. So is that something that you have felt from the beginning? The beginning? Yeah. More so now than earlier. More so now than earlier. Okay. Much, Much more so. Why do you think? Different you don't have to answer? Okay. Uh, okay, other challenges. Come on, like the students, I, I they I had to like, I don't know, they were all over the place. Faculty burnout. Faculty burnout. Is that due to the number of faculty? You think? There seems to be more to do as faculty, more and more and more to do, and there's the ability for faculty to pass that on to new 
other faculty are not there because we're less in numbers. We're, we're attrishing ourselves. So, and it's very hard to find faculty, qualified faculty that okay. we like here. Okay, so that's an, so would you say that recruitment of faculty is a challenge? Definitely. Definitely, okay. That's on a national level. Uh, and that's nationally for dentistry, okay. It, uh, is that a, like a supply thing or is that a location thing? Like, is there a same issue in an urban area recruiting people as a rural area? It's both? Okay. Question? I think one of the weaknesses is the separation of the different offices. Uh, we have the Suncrest location, we have the location here, and even here, the offices are spread out. I know there's, I everyone knows I've been here forever too, um, but you know, it's really hard to see people on a regular basis. We don't get to interact with different departments because we're down on the ground floor, the dean's up on the first floor on the other side of the building. We're very discombobulated and separated from each other. Got it. And it's really hard sometimes to connect. Got it. Other thoughts? Please raise your hand up. There you go. Well, this was kind of already said, but we do have um, some old equity. <laughs> Speaking for myself. <laughs> and we've been really fortunate that we've gotten some really good new faculty, and we've gotten some really good young faculty recently. I just hope that can continue. Got it. Yes. So I'm surprised no one has said the magic word, money. That's a big problem. Now, we like to talk about, you know, we have Suncrest, it's a wonderful place and all, but if we did not have that facility, we'd be putting a million dollars in the bank every year. Now, in fact, we would not be putting in the bank. We would be expanding programs or raising salaries or something like that explain it because I've been working with our two senators offices because all of a sudden we decided to accept one for free care and then that got to the other office and it's like okay how do we send all our patients for free care it's like it doesn't work like that and what I like to say is we are a state institution academically but not clinically that dental clinic that we run rises and falls on patient revenues period and we really do lack for state support for all of the good works that we do and all the Dr. Mextroth would tell you $6 million a year goes out the door when we have our students go on rural rotation. The part that everybody forgets that at any given time, 25% of the fourth year class isn't here. So they're not making money for us. So it's actually a double whammy. And basically the state says to us, that's very nice. Thanks. Thanks. And keep it up instead of helping us. And so we're starting to make that clear, but, um, we do get very, very little. I'm very jealous of a lot of my fellow deans and other faculty, and Dr. Dorn can tell you in Texas when they wanted to build a new dental school, the state legislature writes a check for $250 million or whatever the number is, and it comes out of that. If we want to build a new closet, we have to raise the money on our own. So one of the things that I think you've heard me say this, Virginia is one of four states where the legislature provides $0 for capital improvement. So we are behind the eight ball on that. And if, I'm sure people would like to elaborate on that. Other, other challenges. Communication, so talk, talk to me a little bit about that. It's hard to get communication from administration to faculty to staff to clerical people. It just doesn't fall through all the so time. So do you feel like it kind of breaks, like it might go to a certain level, but it doesn't make it to everybody that needs to get the information to? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So breaks in communication chains. Other thoughts? I mean, what about students or, you know, fundraising and your alumni association and 
think yes. students um, have voiced how they don't have enough patience. So that's been a challenge to them. So yeah, so supply of patience. Sorry. Broken appointments. So people canceling at the last minute. Just not showing up. Yes. It's not at all convenient for patients to come here and park. It's not it's not convenient for patients to come here and park. So that's a huge challenge, right? If you have to other places patients. you got to get patients. And go right out park right outside the door and go to the office. Got it. Yes. Staff retention. So talk to me. Okay, so staff parking off site is probably a big deterrent. We probably lose people because of that. Parking. Parking sometimes give. I'm that loud. I'm too loud to talk into this. I'll have to talk low now. Parking has been issuing passes to students that are downtown to have one course up here. So the students that have all their courses up here cannot get parking passes now. They're aware of the situation, but it is a significant issue with students blocking the parking garage and the people that it passes couldn't get into it because they're waiting to be able to park to come up here. So it parking is an issue all the way around. All around. Yeah, we did hear that. We did hear that from the student group too. <laughs> and if we're talking about transportation, if we're going to have transportation for the students to other campuses, it needs to be consistent to the Health Science Center instead of dropping people off, people are shaking their head, at another campus and having them walk in 10 degrees to get up here. That's a problem, has been for like 10 years. Yes. So where is it? Where do they drop them off at? A lot of times they'll drop them off at Towers or up at Evansdale, or they won't run, they, they will have kids that can't make it back and forth okay. because they just don't run. They think okay. it's more important to run from those two places, but it's not quite fair for all the 3,600 kids that are up here. I got it. So that's a shuttle that runs? That's a, the, it's the, bu the it's, university bus system. Okay, the university bus system. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the university bus system doesn't necessarily drop students off at health sciences. One say I, that was not true, so then I kept track of it for a week, and it's true. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's true for staff as well. Okay, and that adds significant amount of time onto your day having to do that. Okay. So other challenges. What about numbers of faculty, numbers of staff? Because we heard a little bit about burnout Parking, pay, it's hard to get people to work here. She said enough. She said that. <laughs> Everything. Just low staff. Okay. So low staff. So we heard about faculty burnout. What about staff burnout? It's there. Yeah, so it's challenging to take days off when you don't have backup. <coughs> Got it. Okay, other thoughts? And then we're going to move on to the next question. Okay, so the next question is, so in looking at the School of Dentistry, what do you think, it's not necessarily what it is now, but what do you think that the school's area of distinction should be? Like what separates us from other schools? So as a student, as a faculty, as a staff, why would you want to come here? So technology. Cutting edge. Yes. 
Well, I, I, I think uh, one area of distinction should be, especially for this school, is to keep working on interprofessional education. Extremely important to keep working on the training of our future oral healthcare providers to work in teams. So that facilitates more collaborative care and can result definitely in uh, increased outcomes for our patients. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's extremely important, especially if, if we are working, if we are trying you know, to transmit our knowledge and experience to our future oral health care So interprofessional education. I, I would agree. Inter programs of distinction um, are things like interprofessional education, uh, smoking cessation, uh, rural health. Those are the things I think that, you know, set us aside perhaps. So do, does anybody have anything to, uh, to add on to that list? The school's reputation for creating skillful clinicians. Uh, we've actually heard that. It was, I mean, we've probably heard that at every session we've gone to, including the leadership council, the students being aware of that, and the alumni. That's always been a common thread. Dental hygiene is a four-year integrated program, the only one in the country. That's a good one. Schools, but they're not in the dental school. Like they don't work in the same clinic. They don't. Okay. Work so that's the integrated piece, right? Like it's not just we're in the same school; we actually work together. Okay. Other thoughts on areas of distinction? Okay, so the third question is, you know what, we'll skip the third question. Let's go to the fourth question, which is, so what opportunities do you think exist within the school? And think all missions. I mean, think about research, service to the community, clinical education. So what do you think three to five years from now, like if you had to say, hey, we should be focusing on something, there's an opportunity here, what would that be? Let's talk about, let's just throw out research. What opportunities do you think exist in research? Yeah. <laughs> Before I address research, the other thing I was going to say about distinction is one of my goals is that now that we're starting to increase our number of graduate programs, and the graduate program directors are aware of this, is I want us to have per capita the highest number of diplomates of the board. So whereas Boston University has 12 endo residents per year, you know, we have two or three. But percentage-wise, our residents are going to go on and become board certified. and when they, somebody looks at an IDEA catalog, they're gonna see that percentage, we have the highest number. So that will be a point of distinction. Yeah, that's definitely. That's, point. that's really a, a strong, strong goal of mine. And board certification, as you know, in dentistry is optional, whereas in medicine, they have to have it for the most part. But that's something that we could really do. We have great, strong programs now. We could easily accomplish that. Research, you know, and sorry, everybody knows I'm from out of state. And when I came here, I would always hear, well, this is a clinical school, and I understand that, and where I went to Georgetown, they told us the same thing, and we were taught by ex-military people there as well, and that worked great in the 1970s and 60s and 70s and 80s, but that model doesn't work anymore, not completely. We have to have research, and that's partly for money, but it's also for just the overall distinction of the school. It's because we need to expand our horizons. We have to be part of the leadership 
in not only dental education, but in dental therapies of all different kinds. And that's what Dr. Panagakis was really brought in here to do, was to expand that horizon. And in the, the year that he's been here, we've got some programs going with Case Western, with the Univer Uniform Services University of the Health Science, with NIOSH, and that's what we have to do if we're gonna exist as a school, because we can't be, as my program director used to call us, tooth carpenters. You know, we'd say, you know, we don't need to know this research stuff. We just want to do root canals. And then he would say, well, you're just a bunch of tooth carpenters. And yeah, in 1976, that worked. It doesn't work anymore. We have to be part of that research effort. And again, I think when we're talking about research too, it, it doesn't have to be lab. It could be, you know, novel. It could be on how to educate students, new methodologies, the use of technology in educating um, dental and hygiene students. So I think you know, you can, you can broaden that term to where I think everybody can look at how can I play a part in, you know, research across the school. What, so opportunities to be able to do that type of work. Time. Some of us are, are, some of us are doing some research, what we have with limited resources and time. And that has to be fostered more. If you if you want to do that, you have to allow that. Right. And you have to have more faculty, so you have time to do that. Also, in this room, most of the people here are clinical. It's and not all of that. It, that with that being this, the case, that's where the, their emphasis is. Got it. If you're looking at tenure, then you are forced more into that research realm, and that might be something we want to look at too. Right. Yeah. I'm just going to speak to that. And, and I understand. And sometimes I've heard this saying that in medicine, they're 10% education and 90% clinical. Here we're 90% education, 10%. Is that right? I'm sorry. We're 90% we're clinical and 10% education, if you want to say research. But there are opportunities. As Leslie said, we have a school of public health. I mean, doing studies with that. That's you could do that without mixing chemicals or things. Mm -hmm. Some of the things we've had, some of the new toothbrushes that are coming out, approaching dental manufacturers, they have a new whitening agent or whatever you want to put in there and saying, we'd like to test that for you. And we have a really, really, really good school of dental hygiene. And we could be the place for you to go to to test all of your new technology in whitening and in toothbrushes and whatever else you want to talk about. And it's that kind of thing where within the clinical situation, we could do those without having to sit in a lab and, or figure out numbers or stuff like that. We have statisticians, we have Chris Waters that helps out a lot, all those things, we can do it. And that's where I think when Leslie mentioned too, you have to think creatively like that. What about, uh, from an education perspective, what about, are there new programs that we should be looking at? You know, what about the size of our class, the appropriate sizes, you know, just some thoughts about just overall. You know, do we grow? Do we shrink? Do we add new programs? Do we, are there programs that we should look at that maybe we shouldn't have? Man, uh, this is, I'm not used to that. Well, I think if there's a decision to grow the students, um, and I'm talking specifically to the dental students, you've got to have the faculty, plus you have to have the patient population. We recently went through that where we expanded okay. the size of the class, but the patient population didn't change. So then that, met, that meant less procedures for students, and that was not overall well thought out before it was done. Okay, that's a good point. So currently we do not have the footprint or the faculty or staff or patients to grow students, but perhaps we should, if it stays the same, mm -hmm. all three things stay the same, perhaps we should decrease right. the class size. Um, that sounds like we're going backwards, but I think it might be more effective if we had a smaller class size. Right. <laughs> And I mean, I think that a lot of, and not just like within health sciences, but there are a lot of universities just because of the consolidation within higher education that are asking that question now. It's not so much about growth, growth, growth. It is about, you know, right sizing 
and focusing maybe more on particular programs than you know just expanding and focusing on volume. You know, focusing more on qual. Not that you can't have high quality, high volume, but really focusing on the quality piece of what can be delivered with the resources that are available. So other opportunities, yes. Um, for uh, growth opportunities, I was thinking about residencies and we all know uh, we need to start a pediatric dental residency and we're going to. Um, we, a lot of our kids, we can't, we can't get the kids in fast enough and we can't get them treated enough. We only have one block of time per week to see kids in general anesthesia. We don't have any types of oral sedation or IV sedation to, do, to use to treat kids. Um, with that being said, everybody that's working back there is working extremely hard. On top of that, what we could do beyond just starting a pedo residency is maybe even a dental anesthesiology residency. And I think that would be really nice, not just for pedo, um, for us, but also endo could use it. Perio is already doing their own sedation, but it would be a different way and probably open up a lot more doors on how we can see some of our kids instead of just relying on the hospital, which as we've talked about, our relationship with the hospital is tenuous at times. Okay. And if we don't have that respect, we're not gonna have that time. Right. Um, so we have to keep fighting the good fight on that end, but also find different ways that we can uh, help our students be comfortable seeing kids and then also have these kids being seen. Got it. That's great. That Those are two good examples. Oh, wait, on I had another thing. Okay. On top of that, um, we were talking, <laughs> I'm not done. Where's Amy? <laughs> I should be back there with you. <laughs> Keep going. Um, we've, we've talked about faculty, and, and we don't have enough faculty. That's that's a given. And burnout is a very, 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 very real thing in healthcare as it yeah. is for everybody. Um, even if you do have enough to go around, you just, I think emotionally, we put a lot into our jobs. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. We just have to protect ourselves. So being here, I think we also need to look into ways, how do we protect our faculty and staff? How do we build morale with what we have? Because I agree re with research. I would, I would love to do research. Yeah. I want to start a residency. I have no idea when I'm going to find the time to do it. Yeah. And when I get bogged down and I think about that, it's about, to me, perspective and then just doing the best you can with what you have every day and feeling really good about that. But how do we help protect each other Absolutely. from that burnout? So maybe building more programs or sometimes as I enter, you know, WVU has this really, as a university, had a really like warm, welcoming thing and I probably won't see most of those people again. I think WVU wants to harness health within its faculty and its staff. Um, I just don't know like the trickle down effect, like how Got do we it. bring that just to our dental school and, uh, and take care of each other? Those are great. Great examples. And then too, I just wanna make sure we add to the challenge list the relationship with WVU Medicine. So, I mean, we talked, I think, a little bit about respect within health sciences and particularly medicine, but also the relationship with the hospital. And someone had also mentioned um, about children's. Um, other thoughts, other opportunities? Yeah, I, I was listening to everybody talk about our strengths and what a great school this is. But I have the feeling that in West Virginia and Southern Pennsylvania, people really don't know about us. We have to get out there and get ourselves known and not only to the, to the public, um, but also to the politicians. We, we, mm -hmm. we should have some sort of opportunity so that we have the time and we could develop the connections to talk to some of these politicians and let them know how important it is for the state to help fund us, if nothing else. And also to the manufacturers. If, if you want things, you have to talk to the manufacturers. We have to get those connections. Um, part of the problem is we don't have the time. And the other part of the problem is most people don't know where to start. Yeah. And we need some sort of education on how to start with that, um, how to get money for research, how to get money um, just to get new equipment because new equipment is getting more and more expensive. Yeah. So um, 
to me, I think that's part of our challenge for the future. I think it's good. I think it's an opportunity, right? I think that, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. I think it's a challenge now. How can we flip that and make it an opportunity? And I think that's a lot of, you know, looking at how you can develop partnerships. How do you develop partnerships with legislators? How do you develop partnerships with industry that help benefit the school in the long run? And I think that, that I think that's a great example of like really how can we flip something that's maybe not so great now into something that could be beneficial for the school. And I think it goes back to what uh, Dean Borgia was saying about how little support we get in treating some of the citizens of West Virginia. And maybe if we can get out there and tell our story and really work on what our story is, you know, maybe we can start to slowly change that. I know Dean Borgia has been working hard to try to get that done, but maybe we can kind of you know, keep our eye on the ball on that one. So other other opportunities, because we're gonna close on like sensitive of time. I, I know you all have things to do, so I don't wanna hold you, but anyone wanna add another opportunity or anything else you wanna comment on before we close? So, so when, um, WVU undergraduate freshmen come, they should have exposure to what opportunities exist career-wise within dentistry and hygiene, or uh, the School of Dentistry. And service. Oh, as patients, I got it, I got it, yep. Got it, and employees, so what do we do to get our own people to come here? Come smile with us. Yeah, absolutely. Do, does anybody know, do we do anything now with orientation of new students? Or we don't know? We probably don't. They do the, per, the parade, they cross the two crosses or whatever. Yeah. 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 I think it's, I mean, that is really a, an untapped opportunity, right? It's like we have people in our backyard. How do we get them here? Of course, the shuttle would have to come to the health science. <laughs> but maybe we could connect those dots. <laughs> yes. Okay. My kids. So how do we educate the parents before they come here that we exist or during, even during their tenure here? I've worked with the parent liaison downtown. Okay. The problem is we didn't have a, an accurate clinic website to share with them, and we do now. Okay. So when she gets those phone calls, now there's a resource for them to go to to help spread the word of that. But at the student health clinic, too, they are ready for materials from us. Okay. And we have worked on that, and I need to drop some things off. But for from their perspective, when students come in, they can't necessarily help them, obviously, with their dental issues, so they can send them here. But they, don't have, they haven't had, we as a school haven't had tangible marketing material. I don't know, you'd have to ask somebody else how long that's been. But. Okay. So those two things are important, and I think getting to the parents gets to those, hopefully, all of those undergraduates who may come here for care are on an insurance plan. I got it. Except. Okay, so that was a good, that was a good example. Other thoughts? As a, since this is all about um, strategic planning, I think one thing that we really need to focus on, as they've mentioned, is to increase faculty. And um, I think one of the ways that we, what we should implement is more of student loan plans. So students who are interested to come back and join us as faculty um, would have more of a motivation to come back because the whole issue is really it's money. And a lot of these students, when they graduate, just want to pay off their loans. 
Got it. And so if there are these programs that provide or would help them out, I'm sure that there would be more students interested to come back to the school and, and be a, a faculty. So I think this is a really big issue. So you graduate, you're in a lot of debt, and so you go to kind of like a private practice yes. where you're going to make more to help cover yeah. all the debt mm -hmm. you took. Okay. And if there are these programs provided, that, that will give motivation for these students to come back. And so what would happen is, let's say, um, especially if they're interested to do a residency program, or what we could do is we could focus on the specialties where there's shortage and then say, okay, we'll, we'll provide this for you if you go and specialize and come I back. Um, I think there needs to be more of a conversation and more planning. Now, I know this is just me. It's, it's much more complex and complicated, but um, I think I was, in, I was in the, I'm in an IDEA leadership program, and one of the things that the D advocates for is these programs. Got it. Um, to just really bring back the students to be in, in academic institutions. Okay. Other thoughts? Yes. I want to do surgery on my knee. And uh, the nurse mentioned that how hard it is when they need somebody need to get somebody into the dental school for something. And they can't. It takes weeks. To schedule an appointment or? To have somebody seen for something they need done so they can do surgery. Oh, I get it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Some sort of clearance. Yep. Okay. And there's like nobody available. Okay. So this probably then goes back to increasing the faculty number? Well, not so much or the faculty number. Is availability. Just availability. Yeah, availability and communicating with other parts of the medical uh, I got establishment it. up here. Okay. But I didn't know what to tell her when she said that. Yeah. I'm just shuffled off into processing and I don't really... Yeah. Have anything to do with that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, clearly there's an opportunity to make that better, right? Yeah. If we could get our communication skills and work and coordinate with the other parts of medicine right. better. Other thoughts? Okay. Hold on. I'm coming. Sometimes people have difficulty, they're referred from out general dentist for specialty care and, and they're not getting in. There's some whatever problems are and we're trying to work on those things. But the other thing I would point out, and maybe this should be one of our challenges or what our goals, is that we used to have a three unit operatory or dental office in the hospital and they took it away from us. And Dr. Marshall used to operate out of there with his two residents. And he ran it like a general practice where they, you know, nurse had uh, lunch off or whatever, and she could go and have her teeth cleaned or she could have a filling done or whatever was going to be done like that. But they took that away from us. And as much as we've tried to tell them this is a valuable thing that we can do, and that would be the perfect thing. The patients would never have to leave the building. They would wheel them up to the seventh floor or wherever they want to create this clinic, and it could be done immediately. But we can't get them to understand that we need a facility. And I like Dr. Matter's words, we will not accept a flashlight in the closet. <laughs> we have to have an adequate facility. And that's something that has to be transmitted to the hospital slash medical school slash medical staff. I think, I mean, I get personal phone calls from some of the cardiac surgeons that say, I'm doing a valve replace on Monday. I need six teeth extracted in this person. And I chase down the oral surgery residents. And they usually get it done. But it shouldn't be that difficult, absolutely. But if we had that clinic, it could be done immediately. Cool. Any other op opportunities? Again, this is not the only time you'll be engaged in this process. So you'll hear from us along the way. So if you feel like you didn't get something out that you want to talk about, you, hopefully you'll have the opportunity to um, be able to voice that moving forward. I appreciate your feedback and, you know, I look forward to working with you over the next couple months. So everybody have a great afternoon and we'll talk soon. Sure.